Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar in the CERDUP and ESCCP webinar series. My name is Rula Adib. I'm a senior principal at Geosynta Consultants in Oakland, California, and the coordinator of the webinar series on behalf of CERDUP and ESCCP. I will be facilitating today's call. The webinar today will consist of a brief overview of CERDUP and ESCCP by Dr. Andrea Leeson. Following Dr. Leeson's opening remarks, we will transition to the technical portion of the webinar. The webinar will feature results from Department of Defense efforts to manage stormwater impacts on sediment recontamination. First, Ms. Amy Hawkins from NAFPAC Exwick will provide a DOD perspective on stormwater impacts to sediments at naval bases. Her presentation will be followed by a question and answer session. The next speaker will be Dr. Danny Reibel from Texas Tech University, and Danny will discuss the results of his DOD-funded research efforts on assessing sediment recontamination due to stormwater. Danny's presentation will also be followed by a Q&A session, and we will conclude the webinar with a final Q&A session involving both of our speakers. On this slide, we have provided a few suggestions in case you experience difficulties with the broadcast audio. If you're accessing the audio through your computer, please click the arrow next to the Join Audio button, select Test Speaker and Microphone, option and follow the prompts as they appear on your screen. If you continue to experience difficulties, please call into the conference line shown here. You may, you may also submit a comment using the chat box if you continue to experience technical difficulties, but only use the chat box for comments related to such issues and reserve the Q&A option for asking questions for the speakers. Today's broadcast will be listen only. You may submit questions by using the Q&A box on your screen. You do not need to wait until the Q&A period to submit your questions. In fact, we do encourage you to submit questions well in advance of the Q&A questions uh, sessions. Uh, when submitting your questions, please make sure to use your organization name at the end of your question so that we can identify you during the Q&A sessions. With that, I would like to introduce Dr. Andrea Leeson, who is the Deputy Director of CERDUP in ESCCP, as well as the Program Manager for Environmental Restoration. Andrea has been with CERDUP and ESCCP since 2001. Before that, she was a research scientist at Battelle Memorial Institute where she conducted research on in-situ bioremediation and the design and implementation of innovative biological, chemical, and physical treatment technologies for both site remediation and industrial wastewater. Andrea received her doctoral degree in environmental engineering from the John Hopkins University. Andrea? Thank you, Rula, and welcome everyone to our webinar today. Before we jump into the technical talks, I'd like to just give you a really brief overview of CERDIP and ESTCP and then talk a little bit about why we do these webinar series. Slide nine. So we have our two sister programs. CERDIP is our strategic environmental research and development program, and this is really our science and technology program that was established in 1991, and it's a partnership between DOD, DOE, and EPA. And what we're really doing is developing and funding research to impact real-world environmental management at our DOD bases. ESTCP is the sister program, and this is our Environmental Security Technology Certification Program, where we do demonstration and validation of the technologies and knowledge that were developed under CERTIP once they have matured and are ready to be demonstrated in the field. Slide 10. And we have a number of environmental drivers that direct what kind of research we're funding and what kind of demonstration and validation we're doing. So first, uh, most importantly, we are developing work that is put towards sustaining our ranges, our facilities, and operations. There's a very wide variety of 
drivers here from maritime sustainability up to noise issues, sustainable forward operating bases, UXO and munitions constituents. Slide 11. We also have drivers that are aimed at reducing the current and future liability. Um, we're looking at contamination from past practices in our groundwater, soils, sediments, and this could be some of these legacy compounds that we're dealing with, as well as some emerging contaminants. And then we're also conducting pollution prevention to control life cycle costs. Slide 12. And most important in everything we fund is the technology transfer. If we do not transfer the technology to the end users and the people that can conduct the work, then the work that we fund um, is not as valuable. So we have a number of different methods that we've been using for technology transfer that can be videos, various guidance and manuals, Enviro Wiki, which is on our website, in-person training, and then of course the webinars, slide 13. And these all feed into our technology transfer process. Slide 14. And our webinar series has been one of the key pieces of our technology transfer strategy. Um, if you go to our website, you can both see all of our upcoming webinars, as well as archived copies of webinars so that you can go back and hear the audio and see the slides that we've done in the past. The list of the 29 webinars um, are not available yet, but they will be up very soon on our website. Next slide. And this just shows you that the next webinar will be on December 13th and is out of our energy and water program, looking at the utilization of advanced conservation voltage reduction for energy reduction on our DOD installations. Slide 16. Another corner, um, our keystone of our technology transfer strategy is also our CERTIP and ESTCP symposium, and that is coming up rapidly on November 27th through 29th at the Washington Hilton Hotel. Registration is open, and this is a three-day symposium, which really showcases a lot of the research and demonstrations that CERTIP and ESTCP have been conducting over the last couple of years. And you can see the research both in posters as well as platform sessions. So it's really a jam-packed symposium of all the latest technology that we've been working on. So I do encourage you to intend, if at all possible. So at this point, Rula, I will turn it back to you for the remainder of the webinar. Thank you so much, Andrea. We're all looking forward to a very exciting symposium. And it is now my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Ms. Amy Hop Hawkins. Amy is a biologist in the technology applications branch of the NAFPAC Engineering and Expeditionary Warfare Center in Port Wanini, California. Amy has supported the Navy's environmental restoration program efforts in risk assessment, sediment re remediation, optimization, and green and sustainable remediation. She has led the effort to finalize the Department of the Navy Environmental Restoration Program Manual in 2018. She is the chairperson for the NAFPAC Sediment Workgroup, and she is also the chairperson for the NAFPAC Optimization Workgroup. Amy has previously served as PI or co-PI on seven CERTIP and ESTCP projects, primarily focused on sediment remediation and risk assessment. Amy? Please go ahead. Thank you, Rula. I am really pleased to be talking about this topic today because I think it's really a unique conversation when we take it to the broader, um, broader discussion with the multiple regulatory agencies, different for the Navy, different business lines and managers, even different types of funding that play into it. While individual remedial project managers and groups like CERTIP and ESTCP have been looking at how stormwater is impacting um, our environmental restoration sites. To take this to a broader audience um, just ha hasn't been done that much. And I know that because when I started asking people about this specific topic, that is how chemicals in stormwater um, might be recontaminating or impacting sites, 
where contaminated sediments have been or will be assessed or remediated. Um, people outside of the uh, remedial product project managers uh, or people who have been dealing with this directly immediately took the conversation to other areas such as how equipment at um, ER sites might be impacting stormwater or permitting and compliance requirements and sediments. So being able to move this conversation forward I think is real important and then to move into the research that sort of an ESTCP is doing in this area. So this morning I'm going to be going over our Navy sediment remediation program and the policy. I'm going to talk about the Navy stormwater program and then talk about some of the stormwater challenges for environmental restoration and then I have an example at the end. Our Navy sediment program includes about 90 contaminated sediment sites. It makes up about a third of our environmental restoration budget and so it's a fairly mature program. We've been working in this area for a long time um, and in fact we've had a policy on sediment site investigation and response action since 2002. Our remedial project managers have been following that policy which includes uh, requirements for identifying all sources very early in the process so that would include um, stormwater impacts to sites. The policy also requires that all um, investigations have to be linked to a specific CERCLA or RICRA site. We can't spend our remediation money um, outside of that requirement. And then it also requires that there can't be any cleanup before source containment. Our Navy stormwater management uh, is done very locally. The installations are responsible for Clean Water Act compliance and permitting. Um, compliance for the Navy is tracked centrally. The permits and documentations accordingly, we do, we do track that. Um, infrastructure related to stormwater is an entirely different group that's responsible responsible for that outside of restoration or compliance. Um, so coordination when it happens is really done at a site-specific level where you have people who are able to work together. And also um, when we're talking about our restoration sites, not all the stormwater that we're dealing with is from Navy property. We also have non-Navy impacts. A few years ago, um, we took a look, surveyed RPMs who had sediment sites to find out what contaminants of potential concern they were facing. We, did, we looked at them um, in groups, types of contaminants, and so you can see here that about a third of our sediment sites are facing metals uh, as a COPC. One of the reasons that, that I brought this out is because Zinc and copper and other metals are very common stormwater challenges, so we find some overlap just in, in our basic surveys of our RPMs in that metals are a driver for both programs. So as I mentioned, the conversation within CERTIP and ESTCP has been going on for a while with regards to stormwater being a challenge for restoration. Um, in the 2016 sediment challenges workshop that they had, this first bullet is information from that, from the uh, output of that workshop. They said that stormwater discharge um, and sediment recontamination is a critical challenge for protecting DOD investments in sediment cleanup. It's common across pretty much all sediment sites, and there's questions about our are our restoration investments being compromised? If so, uh, where does the liability lie and who has authority to uh, deal with these challenges? We also know that our sediment sites are um, sinks for contamination from 
both DOD and non-DOD areas. We're talking about many sources, point and non-point impacts, and the larger the site, the more difficult it is to link the contamination in the sediment to the different types of inputs that may be coming in. The Navy has also identified that there is a disconnect between the NPDES permitting for stormwater and CERCLA. Um, I mentioned before we have different regulators. We have state regulators, uh, federal regulators, sometimes different groups within the state and federal levels of regulation. And we have the different programs within the Navy that are addressing this. So, so for us, we do see that disconnect, especially because MPDES is not really designed to monitor for the circle of contaminants that we're interested in. So it often falls back on restoration to prove that there is a continuing source. Another issue that we have identified is that an allowable discharge can be an ongoing source at our sites. And I'm going to give an example of that here. Um, Pearl Harbor is a very well-known Navy sediment site located on the island of Oahu in Hawaii. And you can immediately see that there are many inputs here. We have five major streams going into the site, along with drainage canals, ditches, storm drains, other types of outfalls, and then um, multiple cities and a very large watershed contribute to uh, the difficulty in quantifying the non-point source loading to this site. So the RPMs at Pearl Harbor has uh, addressed this over the years. The investigation went on for many years here and then uh, they just got the rod signed this last year. One of the things that added to the challenge there is they had to consider non-point source contributions as they develop their cleanup levels. Uh, they've acknowledged some ongoing challenges related to this in that they do have the existing MPDES permit limits that are above their um, CERCLA project action levels. And implementing source control, complying with the Navy policy in that way, includes doing that both on Navy property and non-Navy property. So I have a few conclusions here that our Navy policy does require us to both quantify and contain all sources before we do cleanup. Um, our stormwater program is managed according to existing laws and regulations. And while there are cross-program impacts, both for the um, managers within the Navy and for our regulators, that we don't have mechanisms for cross-program coordination. So if you're interested in additional information, you can see some of what uh, CERTIP and ESTCP have put together on this topic at their website and some of what they're funding. Um, if you're interested in continuing this conversation with me, there's my contact information, and I welcome any questions now. Thank you, Amy, for a fantastic introduction to the topic. We've received um, a number of questions for you. The first one relates to Navy-specific policy or guidance associated with stormwater compliance. You alluded to that, but can you please provide additional details on uh, Navy-specific policy or guidance uh, regarding stormwater compliance, please? Yeah, for um, stormwater compliance, the Navy follows existing laws and regulations, and we do not have any um, Navy-specific guidance for that um, for stormwater. Great, thank you so much. Um, uh, is stormwater discussed in the Navy contaminated sediments policy um, that you are involved in developing? Yeah, you know, it, it is addressed um, in the problem statement for that policy. Uh, it says that 
water bodies are impacted by a wide range of activities from municipal stormwater to private industrial entities, and then it relies on the general principles uh, that I laid out there of identifying sources uh, and source control to address um, stormwater consistently with any other outside inputs. Thank you so much. Um, a question from the audience on slide number 21. You alluded to some of the contaminants of concern um, that were identified uh, uh, at sediments at Navy sites. Um, you also mentioned that the, these measurements were um, conducted several years ago with the recent appearance of PFAS as a contaminant of concern for DOD. Have you gone back to try and see if PFAS is an issue uh, in Navy sediments from stormwater impacts? Uh, so we were not at a place where, um, where a survey of RPMs I think would um, would give us a lot of information. At this point, um, sampling for PFAS is based on the conceptual site model and whether or not it is expected that there is a route via the conceptual site model to the sediment. Great, thank you so much. Um, the next question um, relates to um, how do RPMs at Navy and other DOD sites address stormwater that is impacting their remedial approaches? Um, yeah, that response really has to be site specific. They, they may in some cases not be able to use their environmental restoration funds to do source control. They might have to be coordinating with other groups like asset management or facility planning in order to program the funding. Uh, investigation and decision frameworks would all have to be worked out among the appropriate Navy and regu regulatory personnel, and that might uh, take quite a bit of coordination. I know that RPMs who have faced this, um, each, each situation is really unique, um, but it's important for those RPMs to uh, deal consistently with the various regulators and personnel involved and um, continue to follow the Navy policy. Thank you, Amy. Um, you've alluded to the Navy-specific uh, guidance. Um, are you aware or can you recommend other important form, uh, sources or guidance documents um, for RPMs dealing with uh, sediment recontamination issues? Sediment recontamination issues. Um, I'm more focused on the resources that we have available to the Navy, and we do have uh, background guidance documents and um, a variety of tools such as that on our um, environmental restoration website, and maybe Rula, I could provide you with that link for the uh, follow-up call notes. Wonderful. Great. Well, thank you so much, Amy, for this introduction. We will pull you back into the final Q&A session following uh, Danny's presentation. So for now, I'd like to go ahead and introduce Dr. Danny Reibel, who is a Donovan Maddox Distinguished Engineering Chair at Texas Tech University. Uh, Danny's research is focused on the fate transport and management of contaminants in the environment, and the sustainable management of water resources. He has authored or edited six books and more than 190 journal articles and book chapters. Danny is a board certified environmental engineer, a professional engineer in the state of Louisiana, and he was elected in 2005 to the National Academy of Engineering for his pioneering work in developing widely used approaches for the management of contaminated sediments. 
Danny holds a doctoral degree in chemical engineering from the California Institute of Technology. Danny, please go ahead. Danny, please proceed. You're on mute. All right, just a moment, please, while we unmute Danny. I am, believe I'm now unmuted. Yes, sir, please proceed. All right, I unfortunately uh, realized that once I had taken control of the screen, I no longer had the ability to unmute myself um, in any event. Let's, I wanted to follow up with Amy's presentation. Amy pointed out the importance of understanding the continuing sources. And so what I'm going to be discussing is a evaluation of this sediment recontamination, trying to, uh, describing a research program funded by CERTIP that it was a collaboration between uh, our group at Texas Tech a group at Geosyntec and at Spaywar in San Diego, part of the Navy, in an effort to try to link stormwater impacts, stormwater releases to sediment recontamination. Uh, often when we link it, look at stormwater, we tend to do it on its own. That is, we're trying to understand the loads to the water body of the stormwater. We're looking at just the impacts of the stormwater. But if we're interested in the sediment recontamination and to what extent that that would influence our remedy of the sediments, we obviously need to look at the receiving end as well. And so our effort with this project was to try to understand how best to do that, how to establish that link. If you would uh, slide, uh, uh, next slide please. So our effort, I'm going to first talk about what our goals with this project, but again, it's just to connect our stormwater inputs with the receiving water sediment uh, contamination. And we're going to use as an example where we did a lot, a lot of our work, which was in Paleta Creek, uh, part of Naval Base San Diego. And so that's going to be the focus of our efforts. And if slide 30, please. So our project was uh, to help us better understand uh, how we could control the sources, or at least at this stage, to try to identify what those sources are, because we recognize that stormwater can limit or reverse sediment cleanup. Uh, we don't, we're looking to what that impact might be in terms of sediment remediation. And again, as Amy identified, before sediment remediation can take place, we need to understand what the releases of the existing sources, including stormwater, might be and how they might limit that cleanup. So our effort was to measure the contaminant strength or con concentration that are in these stormwater discharges, the total mass release, but most importantly, to we need to also identify those characteristics of that release such that we can determine where these contaminants would end up in the water body and what their impacts and effects might be in the water body. So again, as I mentioned, an effort to try to connect our discharges to what is the stormwater um, recontamination or stormwater related sediment recontamination. Slide 31, please. We think that the project that we have undertaken uh, would have significant benefits to Department of Defense. In particular, what are the tools that we think would be most useful to link the stormwater to the sediment recontamination? And also, what are the significance of that recontamination? As you will see when we go through this, we observe that bulk sediment recontamination doesn't necessarily mean that that stormwater 
water is having a negative impact on the body of water. And so understanding that significance is also an important part of the effort. Uh, we need to be able to, to, pry, to provide some of the same information that Amy identified, that is, what source control is needed before the sediment remediation can move forward. And then as we are doing the project as well, we think that we're identifying some of the key contaminants and most importantly, the characteristics of those contaminants that might come from typical watersheds uh, or storm sheds, you might say, that are the focus of our efforts. Slide 32. I mentioned that our primary demonstration is in Paleta Creek in San Diego. This is part of Naval Bay San Diego. This is, as is commonly the case, a, a mixed use of watershed. There is uh, some 85% of it is residential. There's major highway, Interstate 5, running through this. And then at the extreme uh, end, that is at the, in the area that's marked by a monitoring site spots, is part of Naval Base San Diego. And it discharges into uh, and through Naval Base San Diego into San Diego Bay. Slide 33. Uh, in order to understand the discharges from this watershed, we were focused primarily at the lower end because again, at this point, we're looking at discharges to the water body, and then we're going to look at the impacts in the San Diego Bay, uh, in the near waters, as well as uh, in the receiving waters further away from the discharge, what the impacts of that stormwater discharges are. So we looked at a variety of sampling points. At this particular effort, we were focused, again, on the discharges. We were not looking at the effect of any control measures in the upstream watershed, but we did want to characterize what was being discharged to the uh, receiving waters and try to identify what the, uh, again, the sediment recontamination might be. I focus a lot of attention on the location C1W. That is the, in the center of that picture, that is the primary discharge of Paletta Creek itself and the highest volume and most significant discharge into the uh, receiving water. Slide 34. Oh, there we go. We've uh, used a variety of automated approaches, uh, automated stormwater sampling with. Uh, ISCO samplers, uh, but also, again, keep in mind that we want to examine the receiving waters and how this relates to sediment recontamination. So a lot of our efforts were also associated with what was occurring in the receiving waters. We looked at a variety of traditional approaches like sediment cores, we water column sampling, but as we'll see, the primary tool that proved to be most effective in identifying sediment recontamination were settling traps because the settling traps collect information, collect the sediment that has been recently deposited. If you think of a sediment core, they're collect they are reflecting information that may have occurred over a period of years, uh, events over some period of time, depending upon deposition rates, etc. But selling traps that are placed out for a particular period of time, in this case, for example, during the wet season in San Diego, which is during the winter, those settling traps placed during that period of time identify what's coming into that water body during the period of stormwater discharges. You also employed bioassays. The efforts there were to try to uh, identify the impacts of this if there were recontamination by the stormwater discharges. And we also used chemical measures that, were in, we, that we believe would indicate biological availability, such as pore water concentrations, to try to identify uh, how we could characterize the impacts of the sediment or the stormwater discharges on the sediment. There were opportunities in this project as well using other uh, the experiences of other projects that use different tools, for example, some of these shown here, 
that were to attempt to characterize the movement from the stormwater discharges out into the receiving waters. And those tools were also used as part of the project, although they were not part of the, the primary focus here. Essentially, we were trying to measure during wet seasons in, in this particular location in San Diego, during the winter period, both with sampling before, during, and after this winter period, trying to understand, again, that connection between the stormwater discharges and the sediment recontamination. And we used a wide variety of tools and in the hope of identifying which ones were most effective. Slide 36. When we look at this particular uh, area where we focused our attention, uh, this shows the precipitation events that occurred during the sampling periods. And a lot of the rain events, again, are in the period of effectively November into March. Uh, this is common in, in San Diego with relatively dry summers, although as you see, when we first started in July of 15, there was actually a couple of storm events that occurred during that summer, somewhat unusual. But in general, our sampling was conducted during the uh, prior, during, and after the wet seasons. And we were lucky enough to focus on two attention, two particular storms, and that's the ones that I'm going to focus on to, to look at the characteristics of the stormwater discharges. Uh, one of those storms was in January 2016 that I'm going to focus on, and the other in, well, actually also in January 16, but late January. The earlier storm was a large storm, and if you look at the precipitation events, there's a number of storms that are in the range of an inch, inch and a half of, of rainfall during the event. Uh, the first storm was an example of one of those. The second event was a, uh, an event of the order of a tenth of an inch, between one tenth and two tenth of an inch of rainfall. And as you can see that uh, the distribution of precipitation events are almost bimodal, particularly in that 2015-2016 year in San Diego. Uh, that is that there's a number of events that are between the 0.1 and 0.2 inch, and then there's uh, several events that are between the one, one and a half inch. And so uh, with those two storm events that I'm going to discuss in detail, we actually have storm events that are typical of about 80% of the total precipitation in the San Diego uh, uh, during this period. So we'll look at each of those. Slide 37. Uh, one of the key efforts that we attempted to do if we were looking at the stormwater discharges and trying to understand the sediment recontamination, we need to understand how the, the contaminants that are in that stormwater discharge are going to be transported. The one, areas that are of particular interest to sediment are those contaminants that tend to absorb strongly on the solids. And so we're particularly interested on the solids that are coming down in the stormwater and where they go. Uh, and where they settle. And that is a strong function of their particle size. And so the first thing that we needed to do with the samples that we were collecting from stormwater, which is a little different from your typical stormwater, would be to separate them into different sizes. That is, we needed to know what contaminant load, both mass and concentration on that mass, were associated with large particles, as well as different size particles all the way down to dissolved because that would dramatically impact where and to what extent they're going to impact sediment recontamination. Uh, we will continue to talk about this, but I would say immediately or uh, to just keep in mind that if we really want to link stormwater with sediment recontamination, we need to understand how the contaminants are loaded onto particle sizes that settle differently in order to be able to say where and, and to what extent they impact the sediment. And that is, again, different from your standard stormwater monitoring approach. So that size segregated chemical analysis we're going to make use of, and uh, there were a number of perhaps surprising lessons to be learned from this mixed use watershed. Uh, as I mentioned before, we complemented this with bioassays to understand the 
um, significance of that recontamination, and then used poor water analysis, which is a useful tool to relate to biological availability to try to connect the chemical, physical chemical measures of bioavailability to what the bioassays were telling us. Slide 38. So this very complicated slide illustrates what, how we separ separated the contaminants into different size fractions. This is a, a very elaborate uh, processing scheme for samples. Uh, one of the reasons that we focused attention in particular on uh, several storm events as opposed to a large number of storm events, it, what we were attempting to do was try to understand the connections. And so we were monitoring in a, a very sophisticated manner, in a very detailed or complex manner, if you will, specific storms in order to better be able to extrapolate uh, more broadly across different storms. So instead of a lot of storms that we collect a little bit of information, we wanted a lot of information on several storms. So this is the detailed information of how we segregated those samples by size. Let's talk about some of the results. So let's first of all look at pHs. And what this slide is showing is in the discharges from that C1W, which is the discharge from Poletic Week and the stormwater, the first thing that is perhaps a surprise is that a very highest amount of the load in the stormwater is associated with large particles. We often think of organic contaminants as associated with organic matter and the fine particles that have large surface area, but we can see here that the largest load is actually with the, the very largest particles. This is the concentration in that stormwater and again, it's with those largest particles. It doesn't track this, the uh, sediment distribution. If we turn to slide 40, the sediment distribution here is shown in red. And we've also, just to provide additional information, this is still pHs, but now the concentration that's shown in blue is not the total load in the stormwater but the concentrations on the solids in that particular portion of the stormwater. So we have uh, a relatively small fraction of large particles, but they are very concentrated relative to the concentration of pHs on the smaller particles. And again, the smaller particles are the greatest load coming into the stormwater, but the pHs are associated with these large particles. Slide 41. If we look at sediment recontamination the, uh, and looking at two particular periods, the October 2015 basically being pre-storm, and we look at concentrations in the sediment, and this is from cores, we see that uh, we actually see that the stormwater concentrations are somewhat lower, but they are dominated by sediment in this P17, which is actually the closest location to the stormwater discharges. This is the result of those large particles that settle very quickly. And so we do see pHs that are settling in that area. But interestingly, the dry season, the concentrations of the pHs in the superficial sediments are actually higher than they are post uh, wet season, that is, um, excuse me, in the, in the subsequent year. We are seeing, though, that there is a, a dominance close into the source. Slide 42. The reason that the pHs are associated with those large particles uh, has a lot to do with the fact that the, uh, the large highway and the, uh, uh, that is Interstate 5 that is in the upper port reaches of that watershed, or we suspect it is. And what this is showing is that those large particles uh, are in fact carbon rich. And if we look at their, their carbon uh, concentration, which is shown to the right there, essentially the dominant material in some of these large particles. In this particular case, it's a, the red plus sign that shows on the large particle that's shown there. It, the dominant elemental species in that is carbon. So what we have is a large 
carbon particle, uh, potentially things such as rubber from the uh, highway or perhaps a uh, um, some other sort of, of carbon that again is pushed down the watershed, pushed into the stormwater, and is a is a large particle. Slide forty three. If we turn to metals, we see a different mix, and it depends on the metal. What we're looking at first is cadmium. So cadmium is somewhat like the pH is also strongly associated with these large particles, almost entirely associated with particles greater than 63 microns, which settle very quickly in those two locations closest to the uh, stormwater discharge from Paletta Creek. On the upper left is showing the total load, uh, at least in concentration, in that stormwater. In the uh, below that is showing the concentration on the solid particles of that cadmium. So again, large chunks of relatively concentrated uh, material in cadmium and almost no cadmium or effectively no measurable cadmium in any of the smaller sizes. Uh, we're now going to turn to sediment traps on the right side. And the sediment traps, as I indicated in that same slide, is the sediment traps are the best indicator of what's being placed in the sediment or what's moving into onto the sediment as a result of the stormwater discharges. Because the cadmium is present in those large particles, not surprisingly, we see cadmium almost entirely being distributed between the first, uh, the closest locations. Left to right, P1 is furthest away from the stormwater discharge, P17 is closest in. So we see the highest concentrations close in because it's associated with those large particles. And on the upper right is the total mass of cadmium in those sediment traps. And on the lower right is the concentration of cadmium on those particles in those sediment traps. Uh, again, because the particles are so large, the vast majority of them are deposit immediately at the mouth of the uh, discharge point and move very little. Slide 44. If we look at another material, actually one that's often of great concern relative to stormwater, copper, uh, we actually have quite a different picture. And if we look in the upper left, what we see is the total load is distributed more broadly by particle size. There is a copper in large particles but there is also a somewhat of a majority of the mass that's coming in the stormwater is in smaller particles and a very significant fraction that's in dissolved. So we wouldn't expect it to settle as closely to the uh, discharge point, but there's other factors as well. Again, the lower left is showing concentration of copper on those particles uh, in that size fraction. But if we look at what's happening in the sediment in terms of sediment recontamination, we see that in the upper right, we see the mass of copper. Yes, there is a certain amount of, of settling close into the site, which is the P17, but there are a significant amount that is perhaps far away, the farthest away at, a, at our uh, deep in, deeper into the bay. And if we look at the bottom right, it's particularly interesting because it shows that the concentration on those particles in the sediment trap are that are reflecting because of the, the higher concentration of particles that are coming out of the discharge point are uh, actually lower in concentration than what we see elsewhere. This is the first illustration of what we observed in this case is that at the farther reaches, a lot of the material that's collecting in a sediment trap, that is at P1, is from other points within the sediment. That is, it's, it's perhaps uh, from other parts in the bay and there's resuspension. And in this case, the, the sediment is actually more contaminated than what we see coming out of the discharge point, uh, reflecting other sources in the bay, either other sources to the bay or perhaps resuspension of sediment that's already there, not connected to Paletta Creek. So this is a useful indicator to show that the Paletta Creek contribution to sediment recontamination close into the discharge, there is clearly a stormwater trace to that. But there are significant other influences of copper uh, 
when we move away from that discharge point. Slide 45. Now, looking at all of the contaminant information that we were trying to collect, we also were trying to examine uh, the biological response. I mentioned the bioassays. And interestingly, uh, the, uh, we do show that as a result of the storm season, that is, uh, we'd see a decreasing amount of survival in the bioassays. So the blue line on this curve is showing the, the cumulative rainfall over the course of the rainy season. And then at different locations, the bars represent, the first bar represents the furthest away from the discharge point. The uh, fourth bar in each series shows the closest to the discharge point. And we do see that there is a stormwater impact on survival. And we see that as the storm season increases in both years, we see less survival by these particular amphipod in this bioassay test late in the season, late in the wet season after rainfall than if we see before. Slide 46. Question is what is causing that? Can pHs do that? What this slide is looking at is the in toxicity units, an effort to relate that amplified survival to the pHs that were measured. And effectively, the, the answer from this slide is that there are no levels of the pHs, even though they're accumulating close in at the discharge point because of the large particles, they are not apparently contributing to toxicity. We also examined things such as bioaccumulation in other organisms and we don't see significant increases in bioaccumulation as a result of stormwater, bioaccumulation of pHs. Slide 47. We did, however, examine also perithroids, and there's more limited information. We don't have as much data on perithroids. They're present at much lower concentrations. But if we look at the estimated toxicity units from the sum of perithroids, which are not coming from the base, but they are coming most likely from the residential area upstream, uh, we see that the perithroids are showing toxicity and they're showing a toxicity that is related to, in general, to the amphipod survival. So when we saw little survival in those sediment bioassays, that's when the perithroid was highest and actually exceed what we would expect to be toxic. So what we have here is that we have contaminants that are being moving through the stormwater system like pHs and cadmium, even copper, but they don't seem uh, to be related to the toxicity that we are seeing as a result of the stormwater. Instead, in this case, we see that uh, most likely perithroids are the cause. Slide 48. So where does that leave us? So if we're trying to assess stormwater for sediment recontamination, we need to measure the key characteristics that affect the stormwater, which is the particle size and settling, uh, the settling characteristics. So we need to know how those contaminants are by particle size. We need to, if we're gonna make a full uh, connection, we need to look at the sediment, and I think the best indicator is settling traps because we can see what a storm event or a series of storm events led to in terms of settling on top of the sediment. But we don't have the whole story unless we can also connect that to biological availability. Other information that I didn't show shows that much of the contamination in those large particles for cadmium and pHs don't seem to be available because they're associated with these large uh, carbon particles, carbon-rich particles. But the perithroids, for example, do seem to be uh, connected to the uh, toxicity of organisms. And so in terms of protecting the health of the receiving water, it isn't those fairly high concentrations of pHs. It isn't cadmium, perhaps other constituents. In this case, it would be a function of those perithroids. Those are not sediment recontamination issues, but they certainly led to health uh, impacts on the receiving body. Slide 49. 
So we also had different information that uh, helped contribute to this, but they were they they basically confirmed what we were showing. That is models of how the contaminants, uh, how the discharges would flow out and what the deposition would occur. Uh, that we used both in situ and ex situ bioassays, but they basically provided the same information. Uh, we tried to calibrate with stormwater flow models to extrapolate, but again, all of this information confirmed uh, what I had just gone through, which was the lessons were that if we had settling information, like in sediment traps, sediment traps, and we had discharge information that was a particle size segregated, and looking at the broad range of contaminants, we had a, a better understanding of what the impact of that sediment right might be. Slide 50. So with that, let me stop. Uh, just to uh, uh, provide my contact information, if there's additional information needed, there is a full report on this project 2428 on the CERTIP website, and I believe available to anyone if they'd like to follow up. But certainly I could provide uh, any information that if someone wishes to contact me. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Danny. We've received a lot of questions, so I'm going to Go ahead and get started here with the first one from Partrack Geomarine Incorporation. And the question is as follows. Are techniques such as sediment tracing currently being used to monitor and trace a source contaminants through stormwater systems? So where Partrack used the, uh, those particle tracing um, techniques were in fact used uh, in this area. It was actually part of a separate project. Uh, and it also could be used to tr identify paths of flow as well as, as deposition. Uh, I would say that we found in terms of chemical behavior, our primary information that we were able to make good use of is these sediment traps, however. Thank you so much. Um, here's a question from Texas A&M. Uh, do you normalize cadmium and copper to iron or aluminum? I haven't uh, presented any of that at this stage, and we have not uh, done that or not separated that out at this stage. Great, thank you. Um, did your research examine colloidal changes that occur as freshwater inputs discharge into seawater? We, uh, in, as part of this work, we were trying to track that as, as best we could. Uh, a lot of the large particles, for example, with the PAHs, are not associated with colloidal-like materials that you would see uh, significant particle size aggregation and growth. Uh, certainly, though, as we look at relatively fine particles and how they might aggregate and grow, uh, that would be potentially an important consideration. The area that we're monitoring, uh, a lot of, the, the, let's say, the saltwater or freshwater interface where a lot of this begins to occur, was actually upstream of our discharge point. Um, and, but again, we, we didn't monitor that as, um, as much as if, uh, I can't really characterize that very well. Great, thank you so much. Um, here's another uh, question related to sediment traps. Um, have you looked at different sediment trap designs to minimize focusing of sediment deposition to develop more accurate estimates of sedimentation rate? We have not looked at different designs. Uh, there was an effort uh, led by um, uh, other, uh, again, other sort of projects that were ongoing at the same time that the focus was the sediment trap. Uh, we found the sediment traps that were put as part of that project to, to be very useful in understanding the deposition of our stormwater discharges, but we didn't look at the different types of, of sediment traps that might be employed. Thank you, Danny. Um, you focused your presentation on uh, the results of your work um, at the San Diego Naval Base. 
Are the lessons learned from San Diego applicable elsewhere? We believe that they are. We also uh, examined uh, bases in Puget Sound or a base in Puget Sound. And uh, we were also surprised to find a, a very similar pattern of pHs, for example, and um, some of the metals associated with large particles. We, we didn't have as much information from the other base, but we saw the same basic trends. And uh, we think that in terms of runoff from especially highways, uh, if that is part of the stormwater, we may in fact see these large particles, uh, the pH is associated with these large particles, uh, which interestingly seem to add to sediment recontamination perhaps quite clearly, but also from our bioassays shows that they're not very much significance relative to either bioaccumulation or toxicity. Great, thank you. Um, how can predictions, Danny, how can predictions of stormwater impacts take into account the variability in precipitation and runoff from year to year? So the, uh, I think there's several questions or ways to answer that. Uh, one is that we were able to intensively monitor a couple of storms that were representative of all the storms during the period that we were in San Diego. That is, I mentioned that we had one that was roughly in the 0.1 to 0 0.2 uh, inches of precipitation uh, type event, and one that was in the larger inch to inch and a half type event. That were together, they represented probably 80 percent or about 80 percent of the total storm events. So that allows us to project from detailed monitoring in a single storm. But in general, you may not have that situation in uh, other areas. And the two ways around that are to, to monitor uh, over longer periods with multiple storms, uh, or ultimately to use a model such as WindSlam that Robert Pitt, who is part of our group, would, calibrated uh, for many of these sites. And you use that model to extrapolate from the available measurements to over uh, year-long periods or longer. And, and so that modeling effort becomes an important component. Use detailed information in short periods of time to uh, calibrate the model and then extrapolate longer. Thank you. And we're back to sediment uh, traps with a question from Anchor QEA. Did you analyze PCB congener concentrations in the sediment traps? And if, if so, can you please describe any findings or conclusions, if any? Uh, we did congener distributions of PCBs in the sediment traps. And uh, we, some of the key findings that I guess relevant to some of the discussion that I have here is that we also showed that the PCBs uh, availability in terms of bioaccumulation, if we measured bioaccumulation in the bioassays, that we could predict the accumulation reasonably well with core water measurements of the PCBs from the sediment in, the, uh, in those sediment traps. Uh, I don't have available to me right now what the, say, distributions and how the congener distributions changed over time. I do have that information, but I, I can't really describe it uh, right now. I'd have to look more closely at that. Is it content, Danny, that is uh, captured in your final report, which our audience can download from the Startup ESCCP website at no cost? The full chemical data is available in that report. And so uh, perhaps both uh, are this analyses that were done as part of that report as well as any analysis that someone might wish to pursue on their own uh, could, be, could be accomplished. We are continuing to analyze the very rich data set that we collected and uh, some of that information will become uh, available as we complete our analyses as well. Wonderful. Uh, at this point, I'd love to bring Amy back into the discussion and, and try to broaden up um, the discussion a bit. Um, 
Amy, we're going to start with you. You mentioned uh, that Navy challenges uh, some of these um, sediment sites include addressing stormwater sources on non-Navy property. Can you elaborate on what some of these challenges may be um, and provide examples on how Navy RPMs are overcoming these challenges? Yeah, um, our, you know, many of our sites are impacted by stormwater uh, that drains large watersheds and urban areas, uh, especially our largest Navy sites are all adjacent to urban areas and capture that runoff. And so um, one of the ways that RPMs are uh, dealing with is first, of all to use um, some of these tools such as what have been developed or demonstrated by CERTIP and ESTCP to um, try and investigate and understand what that impact is. So Danny's example of um, what has been done at San Diego and in the Puget Sound is a really good example. Um, where RPMs are looking at these innovative methods to um, to understand those impacts to their sites. What can be done um, source control wise is really going to be unique from site to site um, and often it impacts what kind of remedies can be attempted at these sites or can be undertaken at these sites uh, based on how much control we can have over the impacts. I might Thank mention you. as oh. well, Rula, that uh, this, this is Danny, I, that we are beginning and just initiated a new startup project to try to examine common best management practices relative to their performance on different size particles. We, we certainly identified in this project the, the importance of understanding how contaminants are distributed by particle size. And so one of our, uh, our new effort is directed towards evaluating the BMPs and their performance by contaminant distribution by particle size. And we hope that'll be helpful in terms of identifying what management practices might be appropriate uh, in the future. That's great. Uh, is there a, a project number that you can refer people to in case they want to get a project description and track project uh, deliverables? Or ha has the project not started yet, Danny? Well, the, the project is uh, it actually, uh, contracts were signed, I think, yesterday. So unfortunately, I'm, I'm searching for the project number right now, but I don't have it handy. No worries. Uh, this is really good to know that CERTIP and ESCP is ahead of the important issues uh, for Dep Department of Defense sites. Thank you, Danny. And then a question for both of you, and we'll start with you, Amy. Are you aware of changes in policies, standards, or requirements for metals, PAHs, or PCBs that may be upcoming related to sediments? Uh, no, I'm not aware of uh, significant changes coming. Um, you know, I think that the existing regulations for these things, the, the big area that I see the need for improvement is just in coordination because um, the RPMs who are managing the sediment sites don't necessarily have any way to uh, affect things like the BMPs for storm water. So that's where uh, the depth of the challenge lies for them is that um, there's not uh, a lot of ways to control that. And so with regards to uh, changing regulations on. I personally am not aware of uh, what is coming down for those things now. Great, thank you. And Danny, are you aware of any changes in policies maybe related to stormwater that could be of significance at the sites that we've been talking about? Uh, I'm afraid I don't know of any policy changes that are uh, 
currently in the works, although I would say that there is an ever increasing recognition and has been a, a knowledge of the impact of or the lack of relationship between bulk sediment contamination and biological effects. Uh, that understanding and recognition of that is continuing to improve from basically all involved and, and increasingly bioavailability is coming into play. And as we saw in, in this particular effort, we often may see sediment recontamination, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we're uh, contributing to negative biological effects, even though that contamination, uh, that concentration in the bulk solids seems to be increasing. It depends a lot on in what form it is, the, what species of contaminant it might be, uh, and perhaps types of organisms that it might be exposed to. And that's being increasingly recognized. Yeah, that's a very important takeaway, clearly, from your work, Danny. Do you have other final messages or takeaways that you would like to leave our audience with today? I would say that's perhaps the most important, that a that it is not as simple a matter, unfortunately, as determining the load in your stormwater when it comes to trying to relate that to sediment recontamination. They are separate issues, and unfortunately, as Amy just mentioned, the, the often we uh, manage these with different groups in different ways, but if we are trying to connect to sediment recontamination, it's not necessarily just the mass of contaminants coming out of the discharge, and that is a, a big takeaway. So, Danny, related to this, uh, you, you outlined a fairly complicated procedure from a practitioner perspective for assessing stormwater recontamination of sediment. So if you were to pick the most important component of your process, um, what would it be? And how can practitioners at Navy sites uh, reduce the complexity and cost of the approach that you described, but get to good enough results to do what needs to be done? I think that you could get a lot of the information uh, that we identified by using a relatively simple size segregation. Uh, effectively, perhaps a collecting stormwater samples and at least trying to separate out the larger particles. Maybe it's greater than 20, maybe it's greater than 63 microns, but the larger particles that'll settle relatively quickly relative to the rest. And Using that information, uh, I think you'll, you'll have a lot more insight, even if it's just that, a lot more insight as to how the stormwater discharges are related to sediment recontamination. Great. Thank you so much. Um, Amy, before we wrap up, any sort of uh, final messages or takeaways you'd like to leave our audience with today? Yeah, the final message that I'd like to give is that the uh, work that's being done developing both ways to assess and ways to better manage stormwater um, has the potential to bring improvements to this area. However, I think that keeping the conversation going is one of the most crucial things too because until it's understood um, by those who have um, the power to fund the different uh, aspects of this program, the impacts of one on another, uh, the efforts will be stymied somewhere along the way. Great. Well, thank you both for a very informative webinar. Um, our next webinar is in four weeks, and it will feature speakers from the Installation Energy and Water Program area. Uh, registration is open for this webinar, so please visit the CERTIP and EACCP webinar webpage to register for this event. And as Andrea mentioned, the 2019 webinar schedule will be released soon. We will be holding webinars roughly every two weeks, so please stay tuned for the uh, list of upcoming webinars in 2019. 2019, as well as registration information. Uh, before we conclude, I would like to remind you that both the audio 
and a copy of the presentation of today's session will be archived on our webinar webpage in case you would like to refer to them in the future. We would appreciate it at this time if you can please take a moment to complete the survey that will pop up on your screen. This concludes today's webcast. Thank you so much for your time.